Welcome all of you to this live program at Authority Principles. Today, our guest for now is Professor Lyndon Mason from Liverpool, United Kingdom. Professor Mason qualified from the University of Wales College of Medicine, completing his orthopedic training in Wales before going to Liverpool as a consultant specializing in major trauma and fibromyalgia surgery. Before joining the Liverpool University, Professor Mason completed both first traveling fellowships in the University of Utah, Salt Lake City, and the Carl Gustav Karras University in Dresden, Germany. In Liverpool, Professor Mason obtained the Boffers Gold Fellowship Award. Professor Mason's pioneering research has become nationally and internationally recognized, winning 17 national and international prizes in the last eight years. He's been awarded the Hunterian Professorship, the Robert Jones Gold Medal, and the Jacques Dupin Prize from the A4. Professor Mason has won the Chanchen Memorial Prize, the Harris Award for the British Orthopedic Foot and Ankle Society on three separate occasions. Professor Mason is a honorary as a professor at the University of Liverpool and also sits on the Council of the Buffers for as the Outcomes Committee Chair. If you notice, Professor Mason has delivered a lecture on our channel, it's already reached a huge audience. And today is my great honor to bring back Professor Lyndon Mason for this wonderful live program. Over to Lyndon. Uh, thank you very much for the invite back, Desh. Uh, so if I am really impressed by the scope and draw that you have on your uh, uh, channel. Um, so I'm moving uh, slightly away from my usual talk of postural fractures, which uh, I don't want to uh, be only known for that. Uh, Taylor fractures is something that we've also done a lot of work on. Uh, so thank you for asking me back uh, to talk on this. So to start with, um, there's very little evidence. So obviously, this is an uncommon injury. Um, a small general hospital may not uh, see any uh, or only a handful of uh, Taylor fractures in a 10 year period, especially in the UK as the major trauma centers became an entity back in 2013, 14. And most um, of these now get directed specifically to the major trauma as they're usually involved in a high uh, energy injury. Almost all the studies are level four and five. Uh, it's virtually impossible to do prospective studies on these type of problems. And certainly, uh, um, I'd be very surprised in the future if we get randomized control trials in relation to uh, uh, Taylor fractures. But uh, e even with that, the accepted wisdom is obviously to maintain the blood supply, correct the deformity that uh, has been caused by uh, the fracture and dislocation, and then to try and achieve union. Uh, but these are all interlinked. Uh, for example, if you get a deformity, then you're likely to get arthritis. Uh, deformity uh, may also cause uh, stretching of the blood vessel, cause AVN. And if you've got AVN and collapse, then that will uh, inevitably form arthritis and then deformity. So these are all interlinked. Uh, classification. Um, so the Hawkins classification is what most people know. Uh, know this. Uh, they, they describe one, two, and three. Um, and then this was uh, further uh, added to by Canale back in 1978 uh, to the type 4, which showed a dislocation not only at the ankle or subtalar joint, but also at the tail navicular joint. There's also classification on the tailor body fractures. Uh, so these uh, is snapping is the most commonly used. Um, and this is uh, across the board, a compression fracture, shearing fracture, sagittal shearing fracture of the posterior tubercle, lateral tubercle, and crush fractures. I'm not going to go into D&E today. I'm going to keep uh, most of the talk based on tail and neck fractures and body fractures of A, B, C, and F. So approach. Okay, so there's a, a lot of evidence on this now. Uh, Miller has two papers. Uh, you can see here that this confluence from the posterior tibial artery on the medial side, and then you've got anastomosis uh, due to the anterior tibial, and also uh, some from your uh, perforate from the perineal to the anterior aspect. But you can see almost all the blood supply to this area is from the medial side. You can see on the lateral side, it's relatively bare. Uh, there's a, a, a paper uh, representing the vascular foramen, and the vascular foramen you can see are uh, relatively all on the medial side and underneath the neck. The quantitative assessment, again by Miller, uh, showed that the contribution of the anterior tibial artery was greatest in quadrant zero, so the tailor head, uh, but the other quadrants were usually due to the posterior tibial artery. And the perineal artery in their study did not uh, um, make the greatest contribution in any quadrant. 
the measure analysis on outcomes, so there's a significant correlation with poor uh, scores and poor fracture reduction, and no correlation with Hawkins classification surgical portion fixation. We'll come back to that uh, later on. Um, the presence of an open tailless neck increased the risk of complications, uh, which is not really surprising. One of the things that they said was that both complications were highly correlated to the high energy of the fracture, but also to the use of combined approaches, but not a fixation strategy. But the problem we have with this, as I said earlier, is that as we got level evidence of uh, just uh, three, four, and five, um, and people only doing small numbers, it's very, very difficult to make any assumption. And we're using systematic reviews through uh, just uh, looking at either small case series or case reports. This paper came out uh, just this month uh, in Fortnite International, uh, going further saying that uh, AVN um, was actually much more, and non-union and collapse was much more likely if you had a tail and neck fracture which extended beyond this line, as they call the tail and neck the, uh, proximal extension. And if there any extension beyond that line, then there was a higher rate of both AVN, non-union collapse. But again, we come back to that later on. So, so this was something that uh, I came about uh, fixing a, uh, a, a tailor body fracture, and I will uh, look at this later. Uh, but one thing I want to uh, talk about, so uh, myself, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Annie Malloy, uh, Jit uh, Mangwani, who's in Leicester, and uh, Mark Davis, uh, who's in Sheffield, looked at this categorically, and I'll explain the reasoning for this. on Miller's paper earlier that has a relatively uh, low instance of uh, blood supply into the talus. Uh, this paper by Sesk uh, and uh, when he was uh, um, more junior, Callum Clark uh, was the senior author of this, uh, looked at different approaches to the talus, the tailor body. And you can see even with these very large approaches they've done, the, the amount of uh, um, uh, parts of the tailor body we didn't get to was very small. And you had this uh, large central uh, uh, portion that you could not get to. Uh, this paper by uh, Charles Saltzman uh, looked at this uh, with uh, osteotomies, showing that even if we did osteotomies, there was still a relatively uh, large area central on the talus that you could not get to. So this is the paper that we uh, published on the lateral translate minutes to the approach to the tailor dome. Uh, where you uh, make an incision uh, down the uh, anterolateral aspect, just in front of the uh, fibula and onto the tail of the neck. It extends to uh, digital and can be uh, um, uh, moved aside. And then if you take off your ATFL and CFL uh, to be repaired back as a brostrum, as you would normally would uh, later on, you can actually fold the tailless almost all the way out. The only portion of the tailless you can't get to is the brostrum. Could you try? So... As you can see with this uh, cardiac picture, and so that if you've got a tail and neck fracture, you can get to all this, but also any extension into the uh, lateral aspect of the tail as you can get to. So with this, we can see that uh, in our cardiac paper that you can get to almost all the tail the only aspect you couldn't get to the posture medial. And this is uh, uh, with the uh, posterior uh, ligament still intact, uh, showing that uh, this is how much of the tail you can fold out. Uh, this paper was presented in AFAS uh, in Quebec this year. Uh, this was uh, Stoltzman's paper. They took our paper and they added, if you do a posture medial approach, can you get the, uh, the rest of it? And the answer was yes. So what metalwork do you use? Uh, so uh, picotina screws or screws for fixation have been used uh, quite regularly. I'm going to explain why uh, sometimes this is not uh, the most uh, appropriate uh, measure. Like, for example, if you're going to do an anterior to posterior screw, you can cause uh, deformity as it rises up uh, along that line. Uh, posterior to anterior are much better to give you the compression in line. Uh, however, uh, I usually find that the, there's comminution at the uh, tail neck, and this can be uh, problematic. I'll show you a case on that later. Also, the position of your screw, uh, be careful uh, that uh, you have the FHL notch. So if you're doing percutaneous, uh, be careful it doesn't go through FHL. So you do have only a very small uh, footprint to uh, enable your fixation. Uh, the other thing is that your tailor head sits medial to the line of the foot. Uh, so like in this case, you can see 
As they put it down central, this has come out lateral to the tail ahead. There's uh, only a few biomechanical studies on uh, the use of metalwork. Uh, it's very little between the use uh, of different screws, but the posterior to the anterior gives you a, a better screw fixation. Uh, there's only a, uh, one or two papers on the uh, use of a buttress plate, and this doesn't give you uh, much in the way of uh, um, advantage uh, compared to the screws. But unfortunately, in this paper, they didn't uh, take into account your a comminution. Uh, this paper did and found that if you took a, a wedge out of the neck and uh, done a, uh, but it wasn't a locking plate, unfortunately, uh, but you did get a, a better fixation. Time in the surgery. So uh, there's only one paper on this looking at the correlation of your, uh, what uh, uh, day surgical interval uh, the patients uh, get to, and the FS scores didn't really change. Um, but it's hard to know whether or not if this came down to hours rather than days, whether or not to be a difference between them. Also, there wasn't any obvious uh, correlation or uh, uh, diversion and classification between whether or not these were reduced and then left, or whether or not these were left malreduced. So to give you some cases, so the first case, subtail dislocation. So i uh, give you some uh, idea on this one. This was uh, one of my ones uh, from quite a while ago. But as you can see with this one to start with, uh, so I've not quite got the subtail and neck length back. And by doing so, we still got this overhang and likely development of uh, subtail arthritis uh, later down the line. Uh, so one thing I now try to ensure is to get your uh, tailless uh, subtail joint uh, uh, reduced and held with a KY and then using the buttress plate to stop this uh, collapse of the neck. So this is a case uh, like this. We can see a very similar uh, problem where we got uh, the subtail joint is dislocated, the ankle joint is still intact. And by doing so, I've got the subtail joint back in the right position. This is a much better scene on this. And we got a buttress screw on the medial side, you can see a fully thread screw. And on the lateral side, we have a, a, a butterfly um, uh, locking plate to try and maintain the neck. Uh, this case, uh, you can see a, a posterior dislocation of the talus. Uh, one thing I would, these are in my hands, the most difficult to reduce. Uh, if you use a femoral distractor, it gives you the greatest amount of distraction. But even with that, it's very difficult to reduce. If they've got a medial malleolar fracture, sometimes it's much easier to uh, flip them back in, but they go to the posterior medial aspect. Uh, if you're going to make an incision, make your incision right next to the tendo Achilles and the posterior medial. I'll come back to that later on. It gives you two advantages. Number one, it's where the talus is. And number two, uh, you can, um, uh, if you can't get it back, you can do a Z lengthening of the tendo Achilles. Um, I'll come to a case I have to do that with uh, shortly. Uh, so this patient was seen in another hospital and sent to me. They've done the reduction. They've done a uh, approach. Uh, both sides of the talus. And this is uh, the reduction that uh, was uh, enabled. You see the medial malleolar fracture has been fixed later on. Uh, it does show some increase in uh, whiteness, but a positive Hawking sign in this case. Um, this patient done extremely well. Um, he's around about seven, eight years down the line now. This is another case we can see has been flipped uh, posteriorly. This is a, um, it was very, very difficult to reduce. This is the one that I have to do a tendo Achilles release. So by Z lengthening, you can then get that posterior length to get that uh, back in the right position. Uh, so this is that patient. You can see that we've got this uh, just place to uh, allow for the comminution. And you can see this is like almost like a shark bite. Uh, but if we allow that comminution to collapse, what happens is that this then subluxes posteriorly. Uh, she's done extremely well. She, again, about uh, four years down the line following this. Uh, this is a, another case uh, you can see where the uh, subtail joint has been uh, posteriorly dislocated. Uh, it was an open fracture. This is the neurovascular bundle tenting over this medial side. And this one, as you can see, I put a KY into the subtail joint to keep that uh, talus in the right position to then try to control the length as you can see, there's a large piece of tail and neck missing uh, for this patient. 
Um, this is on the medial side. It's usually on the medial side. So these screws, I do. I don't do a separate medial uh, incision usually, uh, unless there's a medial malleolar fracture. And these are, are done percutaneously as a, a, um, a buttress screw. So the tail and neck uh, with anterior dislocation. Uh, so these are a, a lot easier to reduce, I find. Uh, and often if there's a, a segment of posterior uh, talus uh, still left in position, you can actually use this to keep the rest of the talus in the right position. So this is a, a fracture dis dislocation, as you can see. And as it's been brought back, uh, um, there's been a anchor put on the medial side because the medial malleolus was not repairable. But then uh, fixation of this posterior tubercle allows the talus to be kept in the right position. Taylor body, body fracture, uh, such as this. Uh, this was the uh, light bulb moment case, I say, for um, use of the transligamentous approach, because as you can see, we have the lateral ligaments, which have already been avulsed. Uh, we can see that the posterior aspect of the tail, so this needs to be brought back into the right position and then fixed. Uh, so the, the, the old fashioned way for me used to be uh, a fibular osteotomy for this, but you don't need to do this if you do the transligamentous approach. So you can see we've got a large segment here, which is behind the fibula, uh, but it's easy to get to. We can put a, a homan behind the posterior talus and bring that forward. And all this is uh, very easy to approach the transligamentous. And you can see here, uh, sort of uh, the screw positions uh, to enable that fixation. A Taylor body fracture, uh, another case. Uh, this one is an open fracture. And you can see, already see, so you can see the gas in the, uh, in the joint because it'd be an open fracture, but the ligaments have already gone. And usually you find when you go through the lateral aspect, almost always your uh, ATFL has already been avulsed. So it's your way in, unless there's a medial fracture. So this is the case, as you can see that uh, this fracture has been reduced and fixed with two screws. Uh, this one, however, you can see this is the posture medial aspect. So I can't do this through the anterolateral approach, but this is also got a medial malleolar fracture to allow you access. Um, as you can see that, uh, so I'm going to get uh, through the medial malleolar fracture uh, to this posterior aspect of the talus. And this is what has happened. Uh, so I'll show you the clinical pictures now. But it allows you access to uh, fix this posterior uh, talar body fracture back. Uh, so this is the access. This is my usual medial posterior medial approach. I've discussed at length on my talks on uh, the posterior malleolar fractures. It's, uh, a workhorse approach for me for both pilons and posterior mallets. Uh, this is your typical sheath, and you can see this is where the fracture line occurs. By folding this open, you can get to this talus and screw reduction. And this is this afterwards, after we've fixed this back, the tip force has been uh, deviated towards the Achilles uh, to allow that access. Taylor body fracture, uh, another case here. So this one, as you can see, we've got a medium malleolar fracture and a posterior uh, uh, body fracture. This is very common, you did. Um, and this allows you access both medial and anterolateral uh, to fix these bits. And we can see here, even with this comminution, we might manage to get some congruency with this talus. And further down the line, we see we've got a little bit of, and this is uh, going to develop uh, an element of arthritis, uh, but considering the comminution, this is a good result. As we get down to the almost complete uh, Taylor uh, dislocations, such as this, I find these ones without fracture usually very easy to reduce. Uh, through the um, uh, anterolateral approach. As you can see, that this one was, uh, again, open laterally, and this was able to reduce. And I find these are uh, very easy with a uh, bostrom repair and a repair of the ligaments around uh, the talus to keep it in the right position. I do extremely well. This was him six weeks down the line. Uh, he's got back to sport very quickly. An open, uh, complete tail dislocation. This is a, a case of this, where we've got tail of Ickler, um, ankle and subtalar. These are usually very difficult to reduce, and that's because when you get one part of the joint in, usually you lose the reduction on another joint. I find the joystick, so this is a 3.2 wire into the talus, allows it to not act like a bar of soap and keep on slipping out. And you can usually get this in a much better reduction with uh, the use of a joystick, and I would highly recommend that for these cases. Uh, these often uh, develop um, a element of AVN, uh, but in my practice, I've seen very little collapse uh, for these patients. As you can see, it's very white, but uh, he's uh, six years down the line, not required any further intervention, got back to full activity. So results-wise, so if I return to the Hawkins paper from uh, uh, almost uh, half a century ago, you can see that they talk about 
uh, drilling two stamen pins across the navicular and also release deltoid ligaments. Things that we know would uh, not do in normal practice. Uh, so their rate of AVN uh, with this uh, typical uh, sort of 10%, 20%, and get up to 40, 50%. Uh, so it's not true to the uh, current um, uh, practice. So this uh, complication of the Taylor uh, by um, uh, Jordan, which is back in 2017. If we go down the Hawkins classification here, we can see that it goes up to 55%. This is what has been used as a uh, to discuss with patients um, uh, recent times. However, this has been changing. So this is a more recent paper back in 2022. You can also see that this AVN rate now is starting to drop. And this is dropping even further. So this is even uh, due to a systematic review showing uh, still older studies. And we start to drop now is again close from 2017 to 2022. Uh, something for Taylor body fractures, you look at a lot of these, uh, again, very old papers, uh, apart from when you get to the Valiers and Lindvall and Ibrahim's papers. Uh, so of avascular necrosis and your um, osteoarthritis is very, very common following a Taylor body fracture. So then you've got recent work. So this is uh, Alex Trompeter uh, down in London. This was a uh, study uh, uh, due to a, a number of major trauma centers on the south coast in the UK. And we get in now with the AVN rate back down to 5%. So we are moving definitely in the right direction. Um, you can see here that Hawkins classification was not a a indication. One thing that uh, Alex talks about is whether or not a distraction type injury uh, between the tail of body and the neck uh, so if, uh, can cause that AVN uh, due to the loss of blood supply. Uh, this is uh, from Bart, so lucky JSL and uh, Nemo I'm uh, good friends with. Uh, they've reported on uh, over 100 cases and again AVN rate down to 6%. So you can see that a lot of the UK uh, centres now report much uh, better AVN rates, uh, not uh, to the old Hawkins classification, as we discussed previously. Also, does AVN matter? So this was a very small study, 10 out of 14 paper uh, patients in Hawkins, three and four patients, which had developed AVN. And so only 30% required further surgery. And I find this in my practice, even those that look sclerotic, if they don't collapse, they require very little treatment. Uh, just a, a quick one on Hawkins sign. So Hawkins sign is this uh, area of lucency um, where we feel that the uh, blood, as the blood supply comes back into the talus, uh, you get bone resorption to the lack of weight bear. Um, it usually occurs between the sixth and ninth week. Uh, there is one paper that shows that uh, it is it can be uh, indicative of a good blood supply. So you don't really see it in the that then develop AVN. Like as you can see here, uh, uh, Hawkins sign positive, negative, uh, reliable predictor, uh, uh, excluding the possibility of AVM. So in summary, so we uh, return to the accepted wisdom to maintain the blood supply and correct form to each achieve union. The uh, lateral transligamentous approach can access the majority of the talus, and apart from the posture medial aspect. Um, for me, I avoid medial approaches where possible, but people still use them. I don't have the evidence to back that up of not to use it currently, but the, in principle, I sort of I would limit it myself. Uh, bridge plates and AP screws uh, um, are now in use, but the AP screws are usually a, a buttress uh, type of screw, trying to maintain that neck length. And the Hawkins classification AVN rate has definitely changed. Okay, one thing I'd like to uh, uh, also finish this with, as I have said uh, previously, um, we don't have much evidence on this. So uh, I've recently with uh, some of my colleagues start, start this new uh, entity called FACT, which is the uh, foot and ankle collaboratives and trauma. I'm looking for units to be involved. Uh, the first uh, fact, so fact number one is going to be on Taylor fractures. And so I'm looking uh, shortly when the ethics has finally been uh, signed off uh, to our centers to provide ret retrospective data trying to then to look for reasons behind the AVN with much, much larger data sets than we currently have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lyndon. Lyndon, you can stop sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Lyndon, for this uh, evidence-based presentation and really cutting edge you've put it. Most recent papers, maybe in the last one or two months as well.
Uh, Lyndon, uh, you know, there's a lot of interest among surgeons with the use of uh, pre-contoured plates, right? So you showed many examples where you've used. So are those uh, readily available or you have uh, made it intro? Or is it a company that, and also which side is preferred, medial or lateral? A great question. So first thing is, so um, I do have access to the pre-contoured plate. It's uh, the one that yeah, was on show with them, uh, uh, with the uh, patients I have shown uh, is by um, Striker. It's a little butterfly plate and it fits very nicely on the, uh, the uh, tailor body and then onto the neck. So it fits perfectly and you can actually use it almost to dial out the uh, tailor neck comminution on the medial side. So it works very well in that. Do you definitely require it? The answer is no. Um, I know many people who use just normal uh, locking plates, like a four-hole locking plate, and bend it to that position and put it on the lateral side. Do you use it on the medial and lateral side? That's another good question. So when I first started doing uh, tailor fractures back 10 years ago, um, I was using medial plates. And what happens with the medial plates is that because of the way the comminution sits, you end up having to use it and put it exactly where it starts entering the joint on the medial side and you get impingement due to the medial malleolus. Also, you'd have to make an incision medially, which you don't want to do. So these fit on the lateral aspect of the neck, um, in, the, in the area where your ATFL sits. So as your ATFL is usually pulled off, you reinsert the ATFL and then put the plate on top of it, and then you dial it out to get that uh, uh, comminution on the medial side back out of the right position. Thank you, Lyndon. Linda, the other area of interest among surgeons is an extruded talus, right? A completely extruded talus. Sometimes you follow, you find it on the road. So, and it, and historically, we used to say, okay, the, one of the reasons where you put a bone back into the ankle is when you have an extruded talus. Do you think it's still relevant? So, as the, again, a very good question. It's quite difficult. I can't answer it with science because we have so few cases. Um, there's two schools of thought. Number one, if you've got an extruded talus um, that has been on the road, then it's going to be infected. It's going to be colonized. And therefore, as we now got a very good um, uh, body of evidence starting with tailor body replacement, so a metal replacement, actually not putting a uh, colonized bit of bone back in, which then infects the area, which then uh, precludes you to put a tailor replacement in. And so if, eh, that's one school of thought. The other school of thought is um, if you are going to put it back in, then if you take down and denude the surface on the subtalar joint and try to get some blood supply from the, from the calcaneum into the talus, that can actually give you some regeneration within it. So there's two schools of thought. I don't have an answer either way. The, there's a trade-off between two spectrums, right? Yeah. The two patients that I've, uh, that I've had myself, I have reinserted it, and both of them have uh, become infected. <laughs> so on, on my case series of two, I probably will. Yeah. Great. Uh, later, we also joined by Loy. Loy al is an orthopedic uh, surgeon based in Dubai. Loy, welcome to the show. Any questions to Professor Leonard, please? <laughs> Loy, we can't hear you, Loy. Your voice is cracking. <laughs> No, still not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Voice is cracking still. What about you, Lyndon? Can you hear? I, I, I can't hear you, Lloyd, either. Um, <laughs> hear me now? Wonders of technology. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is better. Hi. So thanks for the nice presentation, guys. Uh, it's important topic is uh, sensitive as well. Tailor fractures. Uh, I haven't seen much of this, and uh, I haven't very fixed much much of this. But as a arthroscopic surgeon, uh, one question would uh, maybe: When do you think we can add a scope to to that will help us in a better reduction of such fractures? Do you think it's, there's a rule for uh, scope the joint and uh, do it as a arthroscopic assisted uh, reduction and fixation? So, so yeah, so the, there's, a, there's a few caveats on that. Number one, so obviously I've, I've talked about 
the whole breadth of tailor, tailor fractures. So if you're talking just about the body fractures, um, then yes, because so you, you can easily do percutaneous screws with it. Um, and often you are just seeing the dorsal surface and other, um, not the subtalar surface. So in, that, in those respects, then yes. Um, and you know you could easily do a um, a arthroscopic rostrum to bring your ATFL back with that anyway. The often these are open, so when you've got an open fracture, I wouldn't then necessarily uh, do a arthroscopic uh, um, uh, uh, surgery because at the end of the day it's open anyway. So you you may as well just extend it and the bride it as you, as you would normally. When you get the tail and neck fractures, um, in my own, own hands, I have an arthroscopic practice, but I'm not good enough myself to be able to get to the neck um, as readily with a scope as other people. Uh, if you are very uh, readily able to get to the neck, then yes, you, you'd be able to do it, um, especially over to that uh, medial side. Uh, but in my hands, I, I'm not, a, not as good a scopist to, to allow me to get to the neck that readily. But for the body fractures, yes, definitely. Awesome. Thanks a lot. I think that's it. Just... Okay. Uh, thank you, Linda. I think that's all the questions that we have for the session. Thank you for yet another wonderful presentation. And I'm sure this is going to reach a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you very much for the invite again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, boss. Bye now. Cheers.